everyone. Welcome to the May Database Security Office Hours on the Ask Tom platform. Thanks for joining me. I'm your host. My name is Richard Evans. I'm a product manager of Oracle Database Security. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Alan Williams. Alan is the product manager of Oracle Label Security, Real Application Security, Authentication, Authorization. Basically, you name it. It seems like we uh, give it to Alan at this point. Isn't that right? Yeah, it doesn't have a PM for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alan is the default. We like that. So, all right. Thanks for joining us. This call is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Ask Town platform probably in a week or so. You can go to this URL, bit.ly forward slash Ask Tom DBSEC. And you can see five years or so worth of recordings out there. So you can catch up on all sorts of database security technology. Um, this is your monthly session. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We hold this session on the second Wednesday of every month at 10 a.m. U.S. Central. Regardless of time zone change, time changes, we try to keep it at 10 a.m. U.S. Central. Uh, each time we'll have announcements, a technical topic, and then a Q&A at the end. So any question you want to ask, we'll do our best to answer them. If not, you can reach out to us offline and uh, we can continue the conversation there. Let's jump into a, some announcements now. I try to put all of the links and notes and everything we talk about in this session on our GitHub page. And I'll share this link in the chat for you. So I try to put the doc IDs, the doc links, everything from like the last two years or so on this GitHub repository. So you can use it as like a cliff notes, a cheat sheet for this presentation. So the QR code on the screen, the GitHub link on the page or the GitHub link in the chat will take you to this uh, database security office hours notes on GitHub. Okay. Every month we talk about patching. Patching came out just about two, three weeks ago, middle of April. Please stay on top of your database patches, your operating system patches. Stay on top of your application patches. Easiest way for attackers to take advantage of any vulnerability from any vendor is to look at the patch set that was just released, identify the bugs, the vulnerabilities that were fixed, and then go, oh, okay, I could write something for that. So we see an uptick in attacks once patches have been released. So please make sure you stay on top of those quarterly patches. If you wanna do monthly patching, Oracle has a monthly recommended patching list as well. If you're using real application clusters, take a look at the fleet patching and provisioning, hopefully to streamline your patching ability. And then as always, mm -hmm. Mike Dietrich is the expert on all things upgrade and patching. Check out Mike Dietrich's blog at mikedietrichde.com. We've got some data safe announcements here as well. So every month data safe is releasing some new additional capabilities, some functionality. Uh, in May, they've released a pre-masking check. So this will help you know whether or not you've got the, the right privileges, the right environment set up in order to perform that masking job. So take advantage of that pre-masking check that they offer. There's also support for Oracle Database at Azure. So if you're on Oracle Azure using Oracle Databases, you can look under that Cloud Databases section and you'll see that there's a new Oracle Database at Azure link. So you can use the Start Wizard for databases there. And then some kind of general operational enhancements are available too. So you can start that uh, on-premises connector as an operating system service. We've got some additional events added for private endpoints as well as for audit trails, okay? And again, all of these links are available in my GitHub repository. So that documentation link, I know you can't click it, but you can click on this GitHub link that I just pasted in the Zoom chat and you'll see these links available on this month's GitHub repository, okay? Support notes. So as we move to 23AI, I'd recommend you go check out the presentation from Larry Ellison and Juan talking about Oracle Database 23C, 23AI. That's gonna take a while for us to get used to, but 23AI. Uh, there's a blog post also announcing 23AI general availability. There's feature highlights on oracle.com. 
Always check out the new feature guide as well so you can get to know what is new or updated in every release. So that's available for 23AI as well as our security guide. It has what's new with database security in 23AI. And then uh, Alan will talk about this a little more later, but check out the release schedule of current databases for support to understand what Oracle's long-term plans are there. So you can take a look at that My Oracle Support note for that as well. So as we've moved to 23AI, you know, please go out there and understand uh, Larry and Juan. They explain the vision, what Oracle's trying to do, what we've accomplished in this release. So there's a lot of great capabilities in 23AI. And Rich, just want to mention, yeah. uh, uh, as part of that, uh, take a look at the, uh, the deprecated and uh, de-supported features because that's what you're going to be needing to plan uh, either uh, before you upgrade to 23 AI or uh, sometime after you upgrade to 23 AI. Great point. Great point. Yeah. So take a look at the deprecated and de-supported features in any new release and especially as you're moving toward the 23 AI long-term support. Thanks, Alex. As always, get your hands on Oracle Database Security. You can kick the tires on virtually every product or feature we have within the database security portfolio. Um, more than half of them you can run on our dime. So if you want to spin up label security and understand how label security works, we've got a lab for that. If you want to spin up database fault, understand how that works. If you want to get your hands on OCI IAM, and do integration there. We've got a lab on that as well. So virtually everything you want to do with Oracle Database Security, we can do with a live lab. And please go off script, you know, understand how it would work if you were going to deploy it, understand, you know, use cases in your environment there. So you can go to developer.oracle.com slash live labs, use that QR code. Or again, I'll drop this link into the Zoom chat for everybody who's come in from a previous meeting. You can find that link on our GitHub repository. And then we've got uh, Oracle Database World AI Edition happening on May 14th. So join um, some of our product managers and subject matter experts as they talk about Oracle Database 23 AI, Autonomous Database, and Exit Data Cloud services there. So you can understand what's going on from a database security perspective, we have a presentation on SQL uh, Firewall, SQL Firewall that's going to be a part of this Oracle Database World AI edition. So register with that QR code on the screen or go to that GitHub link that I shared for you. All right, sir, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Rich. So yeah, welcome uh, uh, to the uh, to this uh, the Ask Tom uh, talking about uh, the new security features, updates, it 23AI. Uh, first thing you notice is it is rebranded as AI, started with, you know, the these these branding, started with 8i for the internet era, um, uh, then uh, 10G for grid, 12C for cloud, and we all know what the, the AI uh, signifies here. Uh, we introduced the, we added the vector database to the Oracle database of 23.4 and rebranded with 23AI. So I'm uh, Alan Williams. I've been with Oracle for 18 years. The uh, first nine uh, working in uh, 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 Oracle National Security Group, working on national programs. And then uh, the last nine years uh, at the, uh, the database security product management, working on the uh, products that I worked with out in the field. So the themes of our features are loosely grouped around uh, the concepts of the themes of app simple, making development easier for uh, uh, for, for our developers, making application development easier. Uh, cloud and multi-cloud security has an integral part of the cloud and multi-cloud story uh, going forward. Uh, and then uh, a lot of updates to standards uh, and the security updates to those standards. So just jump uh, jump into uh, uh, this. This uh, Rich mentioned this. This is part of Moss Note 74-2060.1. Uh, and any questions about uh, support timelines uh, for our database releases is contained in this MOS note. Uh, in fact, this graphic was pulled from there, uh, and it shows the uh, uh, 
how long each release will be uh, maintained. Now, uh, the timelines you'll notice are kind of get scrunched at the top. So uh, while 23i looks shorter, uh, it's just because the timelines are scrunched at the top on, on the right side. Um, uh, generally, the long-term releases like 11.04, 19.23, they'll have uh, the five years of premier support with additional extended support. Innovation releases like 21C, much shorter lived, like 18C, uh, and uh, they don't have the, uh, the, the extended release. Uh, you'll notice uh, with 21C, you've got about another year of premier support for that. Um, uh, and uh, we anticipate customers migrating from 19C to 23 uh, AI. So in the uh, uh, innovation side for our uh, the security features, SQL Firewall. We've embedded this feature as part of the database to help uh, uh, capture uh, and potentially block uh, malicious SQL from entering, even getting into the database uh, uh, and doing any malicious work inside the database. So this uh, firewall exists. Uh, you can uh, monitor the SQL not just monitoring the SQL, but the context that that SQL is coming in, the, the schema user, the uh, uh, the IP address, a couple of things that they, to understand, better understand the context, it's set up uh, and the, the database can learn the rules for this and allow a uh, uh, valid SQL to go through. It has and two options. One, it can block, or if it, you don't want to block, you can allow it through, but then capture the violation uh, in a violation log. So this is a, uh, especially useful with applications, but also can be used for direct users as well. This is meant for production use. So it has been designed uh, for high performance, very low overhead, um, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, very, a very useful way to help uh, uh, block the SQL, help uh, uh, do a better job blocking SQL injection attacks. And then you'll be able to uh, capture all the uh, audit information, right? The, the audit information for the valid SQL that made it in, and also be able to capture what was blocked. This is probably my favorite feature. I've been uh, pushing for this for, for many releases now, uh, schema privileges. This uh, uh, bridges the gap between direct object grants and system privileges. Uh, if you have an application that has thousands of objects in two uh, uh, two application schemas, you know, least privileges dictates that you should be using direct object grants to do least privileges uh, for that application connection. Uh, but that could be thousands and thousands of direct object grants to those thousands of objects and trying to understand and maintain that. Um, and also, uh, you know, when you maintain a you add objects, drop objects, you got to keep those updated. Try to debug what's wrong when it's a missing privilege. That's that's pretty tough to do. So uh, uh, this hits a sweet spot with maintainability and security. Well, we find the developers uh, to do a shortcut, especially at the beginning of programs, and it generally ends up getting stuck in there, is that they'll use system privileges for these app connections just so they don't have to deal with these direct object grants. It's easier, yet it's it's uh, definitely not least privileges and allows you to access uh, uh, things across the database. Um, so schema privileges is written like a, a system schema, a system priv, but scoped down to a schema. Um, and this is, uh, uh, so it's, it's better than using the system privs. Uh, and it's also more maintainable than doing the direct object grants. Uh, and it'll cover, uh, like if you do select any table on a particular schema, uh, then any new table created will be covered by that. You don't have to add a new uh, it may, and keep track of new uh, direct object grants. So it's a nice uh, fit between security and uh, maintainability. This is another uh, off requ uh, requested feature to just be able to specify a read only user. It doesn't matter what things are granted or uh, uh, to that user public or through any any direct uh, uh, grant. If a, a user is declared read-only, then that's all that the user can do. It's great for the uh, like the analytics type information. Uh, developer role is to kind of give uh, it's 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 like a, the DBA role out of the database. It encapsulates all the things that developer might potentially need to be a developer. Uh, and this is a uh, uh, 
I, I have mixed feelings about these these roles. I mean, I think it's a great way to let folks know what uh, privileges could be required for a developer. So I, I view this more as a template. Uh, but because this is mostly should be only used in the uh, development environments, it may be uh, something that you, you could use. How, remember, this is an Oracle provided role, so those the, uh, the content of that role could change. Uh, so best practice, even with dev boxes, try to do the limited, uh, the least privileges. Uh, use this as a template, create your own, and that way you can baseline it. Uh, you don't have to uh, wait for Oracle, uh, have Oracle change what's what's underneath the covers uh, for that role. Uh, and it, it, it's the same type of uh, rules that we have with uh, the DBA role, right? DBA role has a kitchen sink in it. Uh, your DBA should have you know, customized a uh, role for your organization, for uh, uh, for your role. And a great way to do that, uh, not just you know, reading all the uh, uh, privileges, but use privilege analysis to see what you're actually using and not using. Security standards, uh, TLS 1.3 is now part of 23 AI. Uh, this applies for uh, inbound uh, database connections, also outbound connections to different services from the database. Uh, there are performance improvements uh, over TLS 1.2, uh, and this varies by the platform and, and the uh, on the version numbers. So, uh, uh, but you need 23 AI for both client and ser uh, server to take advantage of this. Uh, and just to note, TLS 1.1 and 1.0 has been desupported and removed from the database. Um, and this goes along with some additional uh, enhancements for TLS configuration. Uh, if there's no wallet location specified, then we use a TSN admin uh, to find a wallet if needed. Uh, we simplified specifying this SSL version. Of course, it's simplified in one way because we dropped some of the older legacy uh, uh, TLS protocols. Uh, it's only uh, 1.2 and 1.3 now, uh, and you can do comma separation for that uh, uh, to specify the protocol. Now, if you don't specify this, the database and client will negotiate the highest protocol and high and highest uh, uh, most secure cipher suite to use uh, in negotiations. If you specify it, um, you run the danger in a in a future upgrade of uh, when, when that protocol is de-supported, let's say somebody specified TLS 1.1 when that was the hottest thing, that'll, uh, that will that client-server connection will not work anymore if you specify TLS 1.1. You, you specify, usually there's some regulation requiring you to use the latest and greatest. Um, you just keep track of it over time to make sure you're, uh, you're staying up uh, and it's not deprecated or de-supported. Now, the next feature, I really like this one. Uh, you don't have to sniff the, uh, the connection anymore to figure out, did you really connect with TLS 1.3 or 1.2 or with the exact cipher suite uh, that you're using? That's actually available in SysContext user end for now. A wallet TLS, that's something, uh, you know, we made a little noise, we backport to 19C, so it's available, but this is uh, very specific. Right? This is, uh, it's for one-way TLS, uh, when the server just needs authentication, uh, a good, good uh, example is the uh, autonomous database serverless that uses uh, certificates signed by a public CA cert, digit cert, I believe. And so those certificate, the root certificate uh, for those are available in your default system store. So uh, when you say wallet we're still using uh, information, but it's already loaded on your, on your client system. Um, now, this is applicable for the C client. Right, the OCI, the instant clients, so we call them thick clients uh, on Windows and Linux. Uh, this is a, uh, we're talking to the JDBC Thin developers. They said they've had the ability to work with the Java key store since 11G. So again, this, this depends on the platform, but for the, the SQL plus instant client world, this is now uh, available for Windows and Linux. So you can uh, connect to things like uh, uh, autonomous database serverless without having to use a wallet, just using TLS connection. Um, if you need to do MTLS, mutual TLS, then you go back to needing a wallet. Uh, but it's a it's it's a great way to be able to connect uh, a much easier much easier for configure yeah configuration on the client side.
And FIPS, uh, we used to have three different settings for FIPS, uh, TDE and TLS and all the things. So in the crypto libraries, uh, what we found that you know, obviously customers that want to do FIPS for the database uh, need to do FIPS across the board. So they were setting three different parameters. Now we have a single unifying parameter for that, FIPS 140. And so you use that to set those, uh, uh, to set your FIPS. The legacy configuration parameters will continue to work. They'll be deprecated. They'll be moved sometime in the future. But uh, just go uh, migrate. If you need FIPS, migrate to using the FIPS uh, underscore 140 parameter. And that'll apply to all the crypto uh, in, the, uh, in the database. All right. So the things I directly work with, this is the uh, the authentication, the cloud authentication pieces. Uh, this this one's with OCI, our own cloud uh, identity service called uh, uh, Identity Access uh, Management. Um, uh, we work directly with that. We also work directly with the Azure uh, cloud uh, identity service. So this one, um, we with the IAM uh, for, with OCI, there's two different ways we can uh, work with that. One is with IAM database passwords. That's a separate password that you set in your OCI profile, uh, in your IAM profile. And it's something like how we uh, work with passwords with um, uh, OUD, OID, or Active Directory. Um, there's a, a centralized password and all the databases, uh, uh, if your access to all the databases can be le leveraged that single password. Not your S OCI SSO password, it's a separate one that's set. Um, but more excitedly, the tokens can also be used. Tokens from IAM can be get from a client. You can do this through the interactive flow where you're logging in to IAM, to uh, OCI, use that token, get a scoped access token to access the database. Uh, and the database would you know, look up the group information and get you in the correct schema and the uh, uh, global roles. This has been backboard in 19C. You, you can see this in uh, at work in 19C in the autonomous database and all, all the cloud databases. This is only for cloud databases. This is not for on-prem. This is not for BYOL on uh, compute platforms. This, uh, this works only on databases that are uh, IAM resources, its own resource principles. So it's supported on all those platforms right now. Uh, and we support multi-cloud through the federation of other um, providers, identity services with um, OCI IAM, uh, Okta being other ones that'll federate with IAM. Um, that's an IAM feature. And as long as you do a, a skin sync, a synchronization, we'll be able to, uh, and so the user group and group membership information is available in IAM, we all to get a DB token for that user. Um, What's new, now, uh, this is all available in 19C. What's new with 23 um, AI is that a couple of thin clients, the JWC thin um, and the .NET thin with the .NET managed, .NET core drivers, now can get the token directly. And before you use it, it a two-step process. You have to run OCI CLI, if you're a human user, get the token um, uh, based on whatever flow you're uh, doing from a resource principle, uh, or sorry, from an instance principle, uh, interactive flow. Um, uh, now you can um, build the uh, parameters into those clients and get the token directly without having to run OCI CLI separately or having the application modified to use the SDK to get the, uh, the token to pass through the API. So um, it's uh, much easier. Uh, you can just configure the driver to do that work for you. Not available with the OCI, the SQL Plus, the Instant Client at this point. There's no CSDKs. The, uh, the .NET and JDBC folks had an SDK they could rely on and be able to pull those in uh, and, and leverage that. There's no C client. Uh, so uh, the, uh, our, the the C folks, the Instant Client folks, having to do all that work manually. Can't promise anything in the future, but that's something we want to have, uh, obviously, see parity with these thin clients. The other one I mentioned, um, Microsoft Entra ID integration, right? We can take uh, uh, OAuth 2 tokens from that uh, into the database. Uh, this was used to be called Azure AD. I'll probably slip and use that term still. I'm still getting used to saying Microsoft Entra ID, many more syllables there. Um, but uh, the tools can uh, used to, uh, run a script to get the, uh, the token, then uh, drop it into a file location or pass it through the API to the driver, and the driver will send that to the database. 
Uh, it's a little bit different in how we do the, the, the mapping. Uh, the app roles are actually part of the token that comes in, so we don't have to do any group lookup. Uh, back to Entra ID, we just look at the app roles and that gives you all the authorization information. Um, so we just need to get a public key from Microsoft Entra ID periodically. Uh, uh, so your database will have to see that. This is available. It's a database feature. It's nothing to do with OCI or anything like that. It'll work with all our OCI um, uh, managed databases, but also work with on-prem. Um, you'll notice XSCC is not on there yet, but that's something I'm actively working with that team to get this integrated. Uh, this works with the multiple flows, with the interactive flow, where the Azure, um, uh, the, the Microsoft Entra ID, uh, the login screen will pop up. You do the whatever MFA is required for the human users. There's uh, support, and this that interactive flow is also not just supported with JDBC Thin and the .NET Thin drivers. It's actually supported with the OCI clients with 23.4. So SQL Plus will work with that. We'll be able to configure that um, to get the get the uh, the OAuth 2 tokens directly. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for this. The new thing that we just uh, checked out, and it, it uh, we've been working with Microsoft for the last two years, and this is now working. Uh, we're getting, working to push documentation out, but just want to let you know this is, uh, this is possible and available. Uh, it does work. We've worked with um, uh, Microsoft to uh, allow their Power BI, not just desktop, but the service and gateway to use uh, SSO connection to uh, Oracle databases. Uh, and the power with the Power BI integration, you, you, there's a, a simpler way to do this. You don't have to register the database server. You can just um, uh, uh, accept the token, you, you configure the database saying that it is an Azure token coming in. You do a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, and to grant the correct privileges and roles. But it's pretty cool that you, an Azure user can connect to, authenticate to Power BI, and Power BI will pass that identity, the user identity, not the Power BI identity, but the user identity to the database and access what, uh, what the user is privileged to access in the database. So the authorization just flows through. Yeah, that's, Alan, I think that's really neat. And we are going to do our next Ask Tom Database Security Office Hours. We're going to bring Alan back, and he's going to talk about this Microsoft Power BI to Oracle databases in June. So we'll get more on that next month. Thank you, Rich. All right, Kerb, this is minor updates in Kerbos. Kerbos is really just a library update, and we uh, fleshed out the uh, cross-domain um, uh, ability for users in one domain to access database in another domain. Uh, the radius, we've made some big changes. Uh, we've had radius API for a long, long time. Uh, there's some new uh, protocols, the RFCs that are out supporting more secure connections. So uh, we've adopted that uh, with this. If you're using the radius API uh, uh, prior 23, we're calling those legacy radius API. It still works. Um, it is deprecated. Uh, and uh, you can you have to set up a parameter to be able to use the older APIs, but it is available. It is still possible. But we recommend updating uh, to use the newer APIs with your existing service or agent or broker uh, for Radius, or uh, maybe potentially uh, upgrading your uh, Radius server to use the uh, the latest latest standards. Uh, Radius is used a lot uh, for multi-factor authentication. Uh, that's it'll it'll get, give that ability. We're finding multi-factor authentication is also a reason why folks are going to the cloud uh, integrations that we have with both IAM and with uh, uh, Microsoft Entra ID, because when you log into those consoles, it'll force you to do the uh, 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 the appropriate M MFA that's uh, you're set up for. Another long overdue uh, feature: the longer passwords. We used to have a 30 byte uh, maximum, uh, which it's okay for passwords, not really great for passphrases, and definitely didn't work that well for multi-byte. Imagine having three bytes per character. Uh, you limited 10 in the past, so now we extend it to over 1,000 bytes. So it's a uh, uh, that's not something that can be backported. That's actually integral. A lot of things in the database have to change to support this. A lot of features also have to be able to support this. Um, and jumping into the audit side, uh, we've added uh, uh, a great capability to be able to uh, 
specify columns as part of your audit policy. So uh, this helps uh, focus on what you need to see instead of gathering lots of information about that record, just the, the changes that you're interested in seeing and tracking and capturing. So it really helps with performance, helps with the volume of things you need, uh, and also makes it easier to find what you want to find, right? the specific things that you're trying to audit. Um, this is a, um, uh, adding the column information in your unified audit and then uh, uh, be able to capture that. So um, we're going into talking a little bit more about audit. Uh, this kicks off uh, a few slides on audit, primarily about the uh, support of traditional audit uh, in favor of unified audit. Right? Traditional audit's been around since Oracle 7 uh, and is now um, uh, desupported with 23AI. Um, and it's unified audit, which was introduced in 12C, as now the default primary uh, uh, is really the only uh, mechanism. I explain some variants uh, with that. Um, it while traditional audit is desupported, um, your existing traditional audit policies will work on upgrade. Okay. Um, but you can't make any new policies. You can't make updates to that. So we don't want to block an upgrade um, just because that's all you have traditional audit. But you do have to be able to change your audit um, to unified audit either before or after. Um, and it's most likely easier if it's before, especially anything above 12.2 uh, up to uh, 21C. Um, there's... Uh, when you install a brand new database, it just be unified audit. Right? Just, you can't put any traditional audit in that. Uh, with unified audit, there's some um, uh, some uh, policies that are enabled by default, and this actually captures most of the things that uh, customers are interested in. They they pick up uh, an audit on them themselves. So in many cases, these will be enough um, to. Uh, for customers to do a migration, they just enable unified audit, be able to turn that on. Uh, the traditional audit uh, parameters were deprecated. Um, we haven't removed them yet just because for upgrade, uh, we're supporting that. Uh, no changes, again, really to, for you to be able to turn things off. The unified audit, the migration, again, for most folks, it will just work um, uh, because it, the default, uh, uh, policies that we have will capture the information that you need. Um, uh, once you uh, enable that and, and turn that on, then you just turn off your traditional audit and your unified audit will go into unified audit. If you if you continue to use traditional audit, that will continue to go into the tradi traditional audit um, uh, table, not into unified audit. FGA policies will continue as before and go into unified audit. If you have... Um, a uh, very complex audit, things that are not covered by our standard unified audit policies. You have to go into reading some MOS notes so better understand uh, the, how unified audit works and what you can do to uh, replicate that. And if you want to see some of the best practices for audit, there's a tech report you can capture on this. And Rich, am I accurate? These, will, these links are available in your GitHub as well? Yes, I'll need to add that doc okay. ID there, but yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. So that's covers the audit. Uh, Angeline, did you have anything else you want me to, uh, that you didn't think I covered uh, for the traditional audit and the column support? Angeline is the product manager for the audit uh, related features. Yes, you covered it very well, Alan. Like, uh, right. if there's anything like if uh, Fields uh, is uh, looking for or need help with, please reach out to us uh, while you transition. And as Alan mentioned, you don't have to wait till 23 AI upgrade is done, right? You can plan for this transition right from 12 to and above. So if you need any help, please do reach out to us. We'll be glad to help you. Thanks, yeah. Sam. Yeah, well, the main thing is we didn't want to block someone say, well, I can't block, I, I can't migrate until I do this. You can do it after, but preferable to do it before, but it's not going to block you from upgrading. Just don't, you can't change traditional audit afterwards. I mean, other than removing it. All right, so this other this next feature again, something very excited about. Uh, you know, we've we've protected sys objects, right? That is called dictionary protection. 
but we found a lot of features been added to the database through uh, these uh, uh, Oracle provided schemas, right? Things like MDSYS, CTXSYS, and several others. And those are Oracle features. Shouldn't be modified, shouldn't be, uh, unless there's specific things you need to do, but they're, uh, that we, that's, that's documented. But generally, you don't modify, need to modify these schemas. So uh, we've now treated them like SIS objects. Dictionary protection is extended to these Oracle provided uh, uh, schemas. So you can't make inadvertent changes by you when you, if you have system privileges. Uh, in the TDE area, it's more in the uh, standards, uh, keeping up with the, uh, the standards on this. The new default for tables based encryption used to be 128, now it's 256, AES 256. And the new uh, encryption mode, XTS, okay. uh, XES base mode, uh, replacing this, uh, the CBC, the cipher block chaining mode. So that's the default with uh, 23 uh, AI tables based encryption. All right, we've got a couple slides on Oracle Database Vault updates. Uh, with 23i and Richard, uh, do you want to take uh, take yeah. these on? Yeah, okay. yeah. So with 23ai, we've got some some new capability out that I'm pretty excited about. Um, we've got this as a one-off patch to 19c, but now you can create your rules as either static or dynamic. So previously, it was the entire rule set that had to be static or dynamic. But now we are down to the rule level. So that gives you the option to say, well, we know the host never changes, but maybe some of the other criteria that we want to have with our rule set change. And so we want those to be dynamic. Uh, in 23AI, we've got the ability to separate those privileged users, those administrators from those audit logs and that the uh, unified audit policy creation. So this was a request from our customers to say, well, our DBAs don't need to be audit admins. They don't need to go see what we're auditing. They don't need to manage the audit policies. We have a security team that is responsible for that. So with 23AI and Database Vault, we now have the ability to say, even if your user has audit admin or audit viewer, until they are authorized by database vault, they cannot use those roles in those privileges. So again, separation of responsibilities, separation of duties within the database, okay? For a SQL firewall, same kind of thing. If we wanna have separation of who can authorize and administer those policies, we've got a, an authorization for that as well. Okay. Three more capabilities here that are pretty exciting. Um, We've simplified tracing as well. So one of the things you can do now is instead of an alter system and having to have that alter system capability, you can run a DBMS Mac Adam dot set DV trace level, whether it's low, high or highest, you can enable tracing as DV owner or DV admin there as well. So hopefully it simplifies your ability to get that trace information and to work with support or just to understand what's going on with maybe realms that are being violated or command rules. And then a capability that I've asked for for quite a while now, and it's exciting to have in there, is a couple of functions to identify whether the, the host is in the list or IP address. So if you're doing CIDR notation and you have, let's say, a, a subdomain of where your, your databases are located or your application servers are located, you can now identify those in a CIDR notation. So it'll simplify your rule creation, your rule expressions there, okay? And then just some kind of general housekeeping. Hey, if you're gonna up, update the command rule, let's say from simulation mode to enabled or enabled to simulation mode, you don't have to specify all the parameters anymore. So we make it a little bit simpler there. If you're creating a new control, we've got some uh, parameter defaults in there as well. So again, ease of use is what we're working on here, trying to make database vault a little easier for you to use, to troubleshoot, to create rule expressions, and then to flip between simulation, enabled, disabled, or create new capabilities there. Thank you, Rich. All right. Uh, next uh, uh, add-on feature, the label security. Uh, we are on a, a, a path with this. Um, and uh, the, the first feature, we're creating a separate um, label security schema to hold the labels. 
and uh, sorry, to hold the triggers. And that's going to be part of a, a future feature um, uh, that's that's going to require this capability. So it will probably announce that some, hopefully sometime in the middle, uh, earlier part of the 23 AI chain um, uh, rollout and uh, uh, add to that. Um, we're also migrating that from the traditional audit to the uh, uh, unified audit. So we have some unified audit policies for OLS. And uh, uh, there's uh, a D support note here. Uh, OLS integration with OID is D supported. And that was due to some uh, changes, uh, feature changes with OID as well. All right. So that wraps up. It's a pretty quick um, overview of uh, the, the main hit list of the database security features. Uh, again, like around app symbol, around cloud, multi cloud, and the latest standards and updates. Uh, the database security guide and the new features guide, they'll have all this information. But also, please check the uh, upgrade guide because that'll have the deprecations and desport notices. And there's quite a few things in there. Uh, for security. So please take a look through that um, and uh, to be prepared for migration uh, and future uh, migrations. More thing, resources to learn more about this, Live Lab, that's a fantastic resource. I mean, in most cases, a lot of it, you'll actually spin up a, a resource right there, a database there that you can work on. You don't have to uh, take the scripts and do it on your own database. You can do that as well, but a lot of them, you can do it right into the, the, the sandbox that we got there. The security office, we, uh, how long have we been doing these security office hours now, uh, Richard? Five years or so, yeah. at least two years with this blue shirt, though. So uh, please, please <laughs> provide feedback to Rich that blue shirt is obnoxious and then it has to go. And he needs to wear a nice collared shirt or something and you know, be professional. <laughs> anyway, so the, there's a ton of videos, right? We do these every month. So there's, there's a ton of videos uh, for foundation and uh special features and things and that's all available so if you're looking for information a lot of that is still applicable uh with the current database and it's primer this this ebook that we put out every uh, one to two years uh it's a great source about 100 pages for all the database features uh again i'll paste this in the zoom chat um i've got a couple extra links to put out there on this github repository but again please ask your questions in the q a if you have them uh, reach out to me, Angeline, or Alan if uh, you want to ask those questions offline and come back next month. So in June, Alan's going to be back again, and he's going to talk about uh, Microsoft Power BI to the Oracle database using what? Azure SSO tokens. That's a mouthful. <laughs>